Oh shoot, I should have put we have a little video that we that we sometimes put on at the Bee and Butterfly Fund before we start a webinar. And it's just got bees flying around. I should have done that. Ladies, because this is the bees, brews, and butterfly talk, I am starting with my own beer this evening from the Santa Fe Brewing Company, the Happy Camper IPA. Can everyone see that? It's a lovely IPA. Looks great. <laughs> Got it in New Mexico when I was out there hunting quail this year. Brought it home with me. Goes in my koozie. Prescribed fire koozie. I don't know what y'all are partaking in this evening, but I will be having a beer while we're having our happy hour. All right, people. We'll go ahead and get started, even though we don't have a huge crowd. And... I just really meant this to be pretty interactive and you guys can stop and ask questions at any point in time. Uh, I wanted to give you an overview of what's going on with our pollinator populations in the U.S. Um, and talk with you just a little bit about where I am at in the Bee and Butterfly Habitat Fund, um, what we offer for people to do habitat programs, and then just more generic information about pollinators in case you don't fall within our low 14 um, state range that we work in and where you can go to get help, um, how maybe you can host a project. Um, we've done quite a few of those and you guys can pick my brain a little bit if you're interested in putting together a pollinator habitat work day or something conservation related um, that deals with pollinators. So I'm starting with my favorite bee place which is the Bee Beer in Madrid. I, two years ago, went to Madrid and found this little brewery because I try, I, I do like the craft beers. And I found this little bee, bee brewery in Mexico or in, uh, in Madrid and really enjoyed their beer. And this is another one my brother just sent me, the Watts Brewing Company. He is now taking pictures of every brewery that has any beer or pollinator related thing in it. And this actually comes tonight from Seattle um, he's at the Watts Brewing Company, and he sent me a sent me a little uh, text with his picture of the Watts Brewing Company. All right, we'll get started with the pollinator part of the program. Um, here's an event that we do in in Pantown Brewing Company, and it's a beer and thropy event that they do, and part of the proceeds goes to the Bee and Butterfly Habitat Fund to do habitat projects in their county. So it's one of the things we do um, to try and pull more funding in for habitat projects, which is what we do at the Bee and Butterfly Habitat Fund. We provide um, seed for people to do habitat projects so that they can get that nice project done on their property. And this is just the four faces of Elsa Gallagher. Um, I field trial, horseback field trial with my dogs. Um, I've got a Vizsla that I'm currently competing with and a pointer and a up and coming short hair. Um, I like to spend my time in the sand hills chasing prairie chickens. I also enjoy tagging monarchs. And that's my sister and I. She's a bird dog trainer in Missouri. She helps me keep all the dogs in line and keep them squared away. And I love doing prescribed fire. Um, prescribed burning is one of my favorite things uh, to partake in as a habitat biologist. Um, this is a, an example of one of our plots that we work on. And, it's it's um, our program is called the Seed of Legacy program, and we provide next gen seed mixtures, which are kind of a specialty design seed mixture that are designed with all pollinator value in mind. So very heavy to the wildflowers and very low to the amount of grasses that you plant. Uh, and we provide projects um, in a 14 state region and provide that free because we're not for profit. So one of the things we do focus on, we were started in 2017 as a organization by beekeepers, 
wildlife biologists at Pheasants Forever and researchers. So one of the things that we focus on is honeybee and actual pollination services as a part of what we do at, at the Bee and Butterfly Habitat Fund. And we've seen a huge decline um, in our managed honeybee colonies. You can see this on this survey here across the top that, that our annual losses in honeybee colonies have gone above 40% every year and they keep increasing. So we're seeing a lot of uh, losses of honeybee hives throughout the year. This graph will show you what's happening to grassland songbirds, including the bobwhite quail. Um, bobwhites have reduced in population almost 80% uh, through my lifetime. Uh, it's a pretty sad thing that we're seeing. Henslow sparrows, field sparrows, grasshopper sparrows, all of the grassland songbirds are seeing that same type of decline, which is what leads us to believe as an organization that it's, you know, habitat related because it's happening to more than just a few species. It's happening to a lot of them. This, however, folks, to if you want to perk your ears up on the Endangered Species Act and how to become an endangered species, if you want to be listed as an endangered species, I will give you the story of the monarch butterfly because Unfortunately, that is the path that the monarch butterfly is taking right now. We fully um, predict that the monarch butterfly will be listed as an endangered species within the next year. Unfortunately, they just have continuing population declines, very similar to what's happening with bobwhite quail. So we've seen an over 80% decline in monarch butterflies um, at their overwintering sites. And it's a, it's a huge issue. Um, I don't know if you guys are have dealt with monarch butterflies or if your kids or grandkids or nieces or nephews have raised caterpillars in school in their science class, um, but it's a common species that's about to be endangered. If you can take a look here at the migration route of the monarch butterfly, so it all starts down at that little blue dot in Mexico in the Oyamel fir forest where the, that is where all of that um, population of monarch butterflies comes to. They spend the entire winter there. They overwinter down there on that Oyamel fir forest. Then they start moving up um, in the spring. They start coming up through the Midwest. And as you'll kind of see, they go up through the Corn Belt. Um, and they're, they go, they'll, so the, Let's just say your monarch butterfly, you know, your name is Mabel and Mabel's moving up. So she's flying up. So Mabel flies to Texas. Mabel lays a egg on a common milkweed plant. Now, Mabel doesn't like the other milkweeds as much. Mabel likes common milkweed. So she lays her eggs on the common milkweed plants and then Mabel dies. Um, Mabel's egg hatches. That butterfly then in Texas gets rid of his cowboy hat and flies up to Missouri. And then that butterfly lays an egg on a common milkweed plant in Missouri. And then that butterfly dies. Then that butterfly flies up to St. Cloud, Minnesota, lays an egg on a common milkweed plant, and then it dies. That is then the fourth generation of monarch butterfly that that butterfly then flies back all the way to that little blue thing at the OML fir forest in Mexico, never having seen the OML fir forest and being three generations removed from anybody that ever has. Uh, it's a pretty neat, unique thing, the migration path of the monarch butterfly. And it's pretty, pretty interesting to me that they do that. Uh, so the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service put together what they called a heat map way back when um, about where are these areas that they should really focus on for monarch recovery. And um, that's why we chose at our organization to focus our efforts where you can see a lot of the red, you can see a lot of the orange. Um, that's really the, the key areas that monarchs are using. So our solution as an organization is to provide habitat. So that's a beautiful little tree frog sitting on a, what kind of milkweed? Common milkweed, sitting on a common milkweed plant. Um, we provide ha 
habitat for people that are doing projects that provides then the, the native plants that uh, monarchs need. We also provide um, part of our seed mix for honeybees specifically. So we've seen this decline, like I said, the 80% de decline in monarchs, the 40% annual hive loss in bees, um, and then steep declines in the native bees as well. So our program is called Seed Legacy Program, and that's what we provide um, to people in a 14 state area. We just added Pennsylvania and Kentucky um, most recently, and we've had a lot of interest from those states in, but you can see how that mirrors the area that we're interested in for monarch butterfly um, migration. We provide free seed mixes for projects two acres and larger, open to any lands, um, and one-on-one -on -one guidance on how to get your program started, how to get your plot going, and then Pollinator Habitat Establishment Guide, which is online for anybody to, to download and use. Um, it'll help you do a really nice habitat project if you ever want to do one on your own. We provide seed mixes in two pieces. The one on the left in the orange is the native mix. Most of our native mixes are between 40 and 65 species of native wildflowers for that state. Missouri is uh, 63 species. Um, I think Kansas is 54 species. Um, and then on the right-hand side, the purple plant that you see there, that's Phasalia with a bee, a honeybee on it. Um, that plant is a part of the second mix, which is called our honeybee mix, which has a lot of clovers in it. Works really, really, really well as a nice green fire break around the native planting. So a lot of times I encourage people to plant it that way. Here's an example of some of the species that are in the honeybee mix. Um, this is a first year growing project in central Missouri. You can see the black eyed Susan, the bee balm, clasping comb flower, and you can see the clovers in there as well. Oh, this is a beekeeper that we're working with and a little German short hair harpy. Um, we work with a lot of beekeepers on the program. And this is a second year monarch planting, and that has gray headed comb flower and purple comb flower coming in that project. Um, and this is another second year project. This is our monarch butterfly mix at two or three years. Um, this is probably the third year. And that was a previous uh, soybean field that we planted into. I just want to talk to you just a little bit about the things that our high quality projects have in common. Uh, the design, the well-designed seed mixtures, every one of our seed mixture is developed based on a pollinator scorecard that we put together for the plants and each plant gets a rating. And that uh, what we try to do is develop a seed mix that has a lot of um, flowering plants early and late because the middle part of the year, the June and July, there's always lots blooming then. But where you run into trouble is your early April projects uh, or your, your uh wildlife that needs that pollen early in April and then in October again. So we try to really uh, boost those pieces of that bell curve where it's really high in June and July. Uh, and then thorough site prep. I can't talk to you guys enough about that. That is the number one indicator of success on a project is how well, how well designed it was, um, how well you do the site prep. Um, seeding it correctly, that just means you're going to plant it in the fall, you're going to plant it in the spring, you're going to plant it with a drill, you're going to plant it broadcast. Um, and then great first year maintenance. You have to keep the weeds down that first year because with a native planting, the first year it sleeps, the second year it creeps, and the third year it leaps. So that's kind of what you see. You don't see a great, beautiful outcome um, in year two or year one of a native planting. It's usually year three or four before you really start seeing all the blooms like you're seeing on the right side of this slide. And then following up on any invasives that you might have in the site is really important. And that could be spot spraying or just, you know, if you don't want to use herbicide, you could, you know, cut or dig plants. And this just gives you an overview of the annual cycle we like to work with when we're planting a pollinator planting. The site prep starts in the fall of the site prep year by either spraying the weeds or getting rid of the weeds, um, then we recommend that you plant soybeans. Um, soybeans are really, they get really 
great site prep for you. They have a really nice seed bank when you're or seed bed when you're done with them. Um, they have very little litter, and they're usually um, if they if you use herbicide to keep the weeds out, they're usually very clean. So your seed to soil contact is very high. So we have you plant the soybeans in the spring, and then you spray them during that, you harvest them in the fall, and then you do a dormant season planting. The natives really like a dormant season planting because then that seed gets to uh, freeze and thaw and that um, scarifies the seed, gets it ready. Um, and, and it really does a good job germinating the next spring. Yeah, and then you mow um, and monitor for invasives. One thing I did wanna leave you with today um, on your pollinator habitat journey is a pollinator habitat guide that we have. It's online, you can look at it, you can download it, you can print it off, it's 40, 50 pages. Um, it's got a lot of information on how to plant a pollinator planting and, and how, how to do a good job of doing your pollinator planting. Um, it'll kind of walk you through that process. But I will tell you that I really enjoy doing the pollinator plantings in the communities. If you can get a group out there to help do it, um, you can get the conservation department in your in your area to run one of the stations, you could run another station, um, help the kids do some plantings. We, we've done quite a few of those. Um, grouped with, uh, or we've uh, paired up with Pheasants Forever on a, on a bunch of the projects, or in my state, it's Quell Forever. Um, and we've done several projects where we've we've uh, worked with other, po other folks and partnered with the state agencies. And NWTF, there's a lot of groups that we can work with to do these kind of programs. And they're a lot of fun for people. And it's really great when you start seeing people come in, you know, these young people that came and helped do the planting are coming back to the area and looking at it. A couple of years later, I have one site that we did eight years ago. And I often see people in the grocery store asking about the project and saying, oh, yeah, that was the one we planted. And I took my parents by it and they got to see it. So we, we try to do those if we can, on some of them on public land. That way people get a real good use of them. So I don't know. I'm just going to encourage you guys as you start developing your own things that you're working on. If you have a passion for pollinators and a passion for doing habitat program, you know, you can really help feed other people's passion too by doing some of these group projects on a conservation area, a state park, something like that, and pull other people in and pull some experts in and have them help you with it. I love doing it myself. Um, the last one we did, uh, we actually had a beekeeper out there and they actually brought an observation hive. So that was one of the stations we talked about all the foods um, that are that are caused by, you know, that wouldn't be here if we didn't have pollinators and uh, almonds being one of them and chocolate. And there's just a lot of them, coffee. Um, so we uh, certainly enjoy the, doing those kind of things. And I think you guys might if you had the passion for it and wanted to do it. So that was all I had for you tonight. It was a short one. I was hoping we could ask some questions and we might have some. Well, oh. all right. I am reading Kate's note here that says the strip showing people in the room is blocking the QR code. Darn it. Um, I will put it in the chat if I can. So anyway, that was really all I had on pollinators. I'm happy to answer any questions. I was hoping this would be a little more interactive and you guys could ask me questions if you have any. Um, I appreciate being here tonight. I have a couple questions. Yep. Um, thanks for sharing, first of all. Sure. Sounds like a really awesome program. Um, I'm in Pennsylvania, so I'm encouraged to see that you guys added that state recently. Well, um, I was just there this weekend at a Vesla oh. trial. I was running my dog. Oh, nice. Where in Pennsylvania? Uh, so north of Pittsburgh. Well, north of I-80, about as far as Pittsburgh is south. We were that far north. So me, okay. the little area. Okay. I'm yep. in Lancaster County, so south okay. Central. Oh, so well, there's a Lancaster County Beekeepers. I'm going to be giving a talk to them very soon. Oh, awesome. Yeah. Um, On a Zoom kind of thing. So, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, so far. You... I might have missed um, your explanation of how the program works, but um, from what I saw or heard, there's an application process if you have a project in mind. Yes. And then you provide the seeds or plantings. Yep. Um, and then do you provide support beyond that in terms of like actual implementation of the project and maintenance? Um, just curious how that works. Yep. 
so what we do at Bee and Butterfly is we we help you get signed up for it. You have to do the site prep and do the work on the site. We provide the seed, the two seed mixture, the two separate seed mixtures, and then we'll talk you through things, but we don't have a big staff on the ground. So we don't provide, you know, equipment or on site field tour trip stuff. Mm -hmm. um, we just, we don't do that. We just can't. Um, we're yeah. in 14 states, so it just doesn't work out that way. But a lot of times we can connect you with somebody. Um, like we have a guy in Pennsylvania that's actually working on several projects. Um, he got excited about it. He works for the North American Land Trust. Uh -huh. um, and he actually does some of the habitat work on the side and helps people get their projects started. So we're, we're lucky enough in several states to have folks that have kind of jumped up and want to help others get their projects started. Do you provide any sort of funding for, like, in addition to the seeds, funding for hiring someone like that to help with the project? Or is it kind of assumed that it's a volunteer thing? It's a, yeah, it's more of a volunteer thing. We, we are not a, so we're not like USD, you know, we're just a, we're a fairly relatively small not-for-profit. Um, I say that we're growing really big. I have 300 applications for projects sitting on my desk right now. Oh my um, God. So we're growing and growing. I mean, adding Pennsylvania and Kentucky really kind of boosted a lot of uh, the interest up, I think. And um, so I have a lot of applications, but we don't, we don't provide, um, we don't provide any cost share for the projects and we don't provide any support for actually getting the planting done other than you know you can call and we can talk you through things um a lot of times there's uh soil and water districts in the areas that can help out with renting equipment uh those types of things sometimes pf will have a habitat team or something that could maybe help out with a project um what i tell people all the time is like ask a local farmer somewhere down the road to just go ahead and put soybeans in for you on your site. And that will be your site prep. And a mm. lot of times if it's a big enough plot, you know, they'll do it so that they can just have the beans off the, off the plot. And it's, it's just a, it's a way to just use farming to get you in the end where you want to be. Um, but Cause the broadcasting that can be Johnny Appleseed. You can grab that seed and just throw it out. I mean, that's how we do it with all the youth programs. You don't okay. need to, um, rent special equipment to seed as long as you have good seed to soil contact and a really clean seed bed to start with you don't need to get special equipment to broadcast it or to drill it um, just broadcast it in um, November uh, and then just let you know mother nature do the work of raining on it and snowing on it and letting it move its way down the soil where it needs to be yeah okay yeah um and then I just have, yeah, thank you for explaining that. Um, I'm currently working my way through Doug Ptolemy's book, Bringing Nature Home. Yep. Have you read that? Yes, I've seen him in person a few times. I really like him. Yeah, yep. I have as well. I just wanted to share that in case anyone um, is looking for a good read. Um, and then also, are you familiar with the Homegrown National Park Program? Boy, I'm not Laurel. It's I'm National Park. It, um, I think Doug Ptolemy might have helped start. Yeah, it, actually, I think he started it. Anyway, it's um a program. I might botch this, but it's encourages landowners to um convert their landscaping to all native plantings and pollinators and you can actually get certified as a um native wildlife habitat like okay. someone will, someone will come out and assess all the landscaping and has to meet certain criteria um but it's a really cool program and they have like a map showing um all the um landscapes that have been certified so i just wanted to share that as well i can i'll put a link in the chat yeah yeah that'd be great i have a question elsa before you go great uh J jess rockman from western Hi, north western north dakota hello oh, yeah north dakota is one of our favorite places 
Oh, fantastic. It totally it's, is. It it's is like, a wonderful forgotten place. <laughs> our board of director, our um, president of our board, I'm going to call him the wrong thing. He's not a president, but our board of director, the, the fellow in charge of that is a beekeeper in North Dakota near Jamestown. Oh, fantastic. I That's a very North Dakota story. <laughs> right. Good one. I, I've read over the, the material on the website. I was just serendipity that I found this webinar and I'm so glad I made it. You gave a great presentation. Um, I'm a I would be a checkbox like a, for all of the things listed, okay. rural area, tractor equipment, et cetera, et cetera. The, uh, I, my question is, since I am surrounded by um, other farm fields, as typically is the case, do you find that these plantings, uh, do you have best practices or recommendations for fields that would be adjacent to flax and wheat and the things that are, are grown and sprayed uh, when, when trying to at least establish a buffer zone such as sure. one of these plantings? No, this is great. Uh, we... We have found that our plantings next to agriculture do just as well as our plantings that are next to, say, just grass. Um, so what what I do recommend usually, and I recommend it almost on all the projects anyway, is is this picture frame approach where the frame of the actual picture is our honeybee mix, the clover mix okay. um, that is on the frame. And then the inside, the actual picture itself is then the native planting like behind my shoulder here, the the um, the all native uh, with all the wildflowers and the grasses. Um, and, and what that does is that clover kind of, um, it serves as a little bit of a buffer for your native planting um, in a lot of ways. It'll stop grasses from creeping in. It stops weeds from creeping in. It stops fire from creeping out if you're light, lighting the fire on the inside. Um, it's, it's a really nice way to um, have a good transition between a crop field or a grass field or, or anything else you've got. Um, and, and I really like that, that methodology. And, and you're lucky enough that you're, if you're in agriculture area, you can then get someone to put in the soybeans. I know I was really surprised last time I was up in Fargo, uh, how much agriculture there was there. Um, I <laughs> didn't know North Dakota, that was the last great place for people to they, they said to take their bees. So, so these beekeepers will take their bees and all summer long, they will let their bees forage on native prairies, on the native landscapes, um, and let their bees get healthy and grow good quality hives and, and produce honey. And then they take those bees, these big beekeepers, not the little ones, but the really big beekeepers, will then load all those bees on to semis and take them to California to pollinate almonds. And it sounds like, oh, well, that's great. Good for the bees. They get to go pollinate. Well, it's not a healthy situation for the bees. They come back like kind of tired and like they've run marathons. Um, and so they need a place to then re rejuvenate, regenerate. And it used to be North Dakota. North Dakota used to be the last great place for people to bring bees to. Uh, and now they've gone so much more into agriculture. Soybeans are up in, in North Dakota where they never used to be. Corn yeah. and soybeans up in the Dakotas. And it didn't used to be that way. And it used to just be kind of, you know, native prairie type habitat. So now we have to manage more on purpose. Um, we just have to be a little more uh, conscious of that. And instead of being reactive, we, we have to really you know, be proactive on these plantings and, and get good quality habitat in there. Oh, great. Th thank you very much. I appreciate it. Sure. Sure. I'm glad you're on. I mean, it was a good, good thing that you're on. <laughs> yep. yep. It's a pleasure to meet you as well. Yeah, you too. So I'm the Artemis ambassador for Missouri now. I, I keep trying to um let Carly know that I'm about, you know, <laughs> I'm, I'm about worked out from work and just, uh like I said, you know, a bunch of bunch of things going on with work right now they're really growing strong but i i love artemis it's just such a great program to have women leading other women and i, I just love it it's a it's a really great program that is fantastic they are well represented <laughs> hey elsa i have a question 
Yep, Kate. So I'm looking at doing some of this work, not only here on our little 10 acre farm in Virginia, and I, I know you, that Virginia is not yet a state for the BM Butterfly Fund. Hopefully, um, you know, down the road, we can get in on that. But um, when this stuff is planted, because I'm looking at doing part of this through our Quill Forever chapter that we have here in Virginia, and we've got some places where we can certainly put this habitat into, but once this habitat goes in and assuming we have done the soybeans and we've done everything correctly, what is the expectancy of that vegetation? Is it just consistently year after year, it's receding, receding, receding? I know I I did a, a spot here on the farm, but after seeing how I probably should have done it, I understand why it's no longer really there. Some of the black eyed Susans are there and there's a bunch of other smaller things that'll pop up here and there before the chickens get them. But yeah, um, well, Kate, two things. One, just what you ended on here. Site prep is like 90 plus percent of the answer. Like you have to do good quality site prep. If we have bad projects, it always, always comes back to the fact that the site prep wasn't done correctly. They they maybe planted sooner. They thought maybe one spring was enough. They thought maybe one tillage was enough. Um, you know, we 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 honestly prefer herbicide over tillage just because once you turn that soil over, there's erosion issues and there's the issue of all the seed that's in the seed bank is now at the top of the soil and it will then all germinate. So there, there's a lot of, a lot of tips in there. And, and, you know, you, you are probably just like me who just wants, the, I just want some really pretty wildflowers out there and I don't yeah. want to <laughs> an entire year of nothing to get there, but you do, you have to go through that entire year of nothing to get there. That's just, that's the answer. I mean, so site prep is super, super, super. I can't say enough how important site prep is. That okay. whole year needs to just be committed to absolutely terminating everything that's there. Um, and you do that. And then once you've done that, you've provided a seed bed or, or a, a, like a, a area that you can then grow your really great pollinator plants. But like I said, the native plants, it takes like two or three years for you to really see much there. So you have to be diligent the first year about mowing and keeping the weeds out because the first thing that's going to come up after you've killed everything out for that first year um, and then you've seeded over the winter you, the first thing that comes up, you're going to be like, oh, my stuff's coming up. Well, it's probably going to be weeds. Annual weeds do just, they take advantage. That's why they're weedy. That's why they're there. Um, they take advantage of any open spot with water and sunshine and they just grow. So you, you just kind of have to keep a mowing regime up that first year. Um, after that, you really, you don't need to really reseed these plantings. If you can use prescribed fire, you're better than 70% of the people. A lot of people can't use prescribed fire. A lot of states don't use it. Missouri is very, very, very lucky. We use prescribed fire all the time. We just burnt on Easter at my house. Um, it's just common here. The conservation department's very active doing prescribed fire. Um, prescribed fire really is a good thing to rejuvenate your planting, but, but I wouldn't do that on a native planting probably till year four. You know, you, you're still getting established in year two and three, um, maybe year four, you want to come in with a fire, um, but it ought to recede itself. You shouldn't be having problems with a, with a seeding issue um, on a native planting. I mean, these plants yeah. got some, you know, 20, 30 years old that still look great. Um, yeah. what, ha what tends to happen, Kate, is that you tend to get uh, grasses that try and overtake the planting. And there's a few grass selective herbicides you can use to, to offset that, you know, to really kind of set the grasses back a little bit. Yeah. And I think, I think that's exactly what happened. And so I know year one and two, when I did this, I think this is the fourth year that I've had this patch. So year one and two had the neighbor come over with the tiller on the back of his tractor and tilled up the ground, kind of did a rough till though. Okay. And I'm thinking it probably needed to be a finer till just for that better soil seed contact. But I know that when the flowers came up, I have never seen so many chickadees and nuthatches and 
Oh, just in yeah. that first year, it was so intense. And I'm talking Elsa, I've got like, this is, this is in the center of where our driveway is. So it's like a big loop around the driveway. Yep. And that centerpiece is like maybe a half an acre, three quarters of an acre. Yep. And they're all in there because it's oh. there. I mean, they love the native stuff. I mean, they just love it. They'll, they'll it thrive. was insane how many butterflies and bees and birds and stuff. And then especially over the winter, because I didn't mow anything. They all just went for those seed heads through the winter. Oh well, my God. Just, just shoot me an email and I will, I think, so our program, my program that I run a part of our, the bee and butterfly is the seed of legacy program. The program that our executive director runs is called Solar Synergy, and they work under solar panels and to try and get like native plantings, not under the panels because they're way too tall, but native plantings adjacent to solar huh. projects. So that your solar project is a little, little greener um, and you're getting a little more of a pollinator benefit from whatever you're doing under the panels with like our honeybee mix and then outside the panels with our native mix. Um, and I think that we had a Virginia project. So, and what that means for you, Kate, is that we have a Virginia seed mix that we developed that I can send you. You can, oh, you can sweet. source it wherever you want and get it, or you could get it from the people we get it from. Um, but I'm I'm happy to send that if I, if I can, if that's true. I think we did have a Virginia project though. It, and so the honeybee mix is just a gen generic, pretty much, you know, clover mix. And I would, you know, I would still recommend that on a project. Um, even if you wanted to go all native, the, the clover mix is a really good mix uh, for bumblebees, honeybees, and a really good fire break. So there's a lot of positives to having that two-piece mix. A lot of people don't want to because it's not native, um, but clovers aren't invasive. They're just not native. They're just, you know, kind of a, you know, naturalized clover. Yeah. So, yeah. Okay. That's sure. awesome. Thank you. Yeah, sure thing. Well, I appreciate you guys coming on. I know it was a small group, but Hey, it's still good. And now I have time to pack for my turkey hunting trip in Nebraska that I'm going on tomorrow morning. So if you ladies need um, any help with anything on your pollinator stuff, reach out. I will. Oh, I'll just put my email here in the, in the chat. And you guys can reach out anytime, have any questions. Kate, follow up with me on that Virginia thing. Because like I said, I'm leaving for Nebraska at 6 a.m. So I might not make that note to myself. Yeah, absolutely. I'm going to shoot you an email this evening, Elsa. Great. I will get that when I get back. I'll be back on Tuesday or Wednesday. Yeah, good luck. I will have a big fat turkey, hopefully, sitting on the tailgate, maybe maybe by Saturday at one. I don't know. We'll see. I've been successful there before, but it's a different year. You never know with turkeys. Yeah. All right, ladies. Well, I appreciate it. I know it was a small group, but I still enjoyed being here. And if you have any questions or need any help with your pollinator stuff, just let me know. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you so much. No problem. Take care. Yep. You guys too.